Hello, fellas. My name is Paquito de Rivera, saxophone player, composer, clarinet player, and writer. I was born in the island of Cuba. Nobody is perfect. And I have been in American cities for the last 27 years so far. Great. Great. <laughs> um, we've been we've been talking to uh, different artists about their the sense of place where they come from. I mean, you know, there's a lot of mass mediated culture. Television tells us what to think about and so forth. But but you come from a particular area in Cuba. Can you talk about what what your sense of place is and what it means to you? Uh, to be. A and I'm going to have you talk right to me too. Go ahead. Oh, oh, Sorry. I thought you want me to. Go. Okay. <laughs> to be Cuban is a little more than being born in a place. It's a very special place, even with the terrible political situation that we have been suffering for the last half a century, almost. Uh, Cuba remains a very uh, artistic place. It's a very uh, uh, cultural place. We have great musicians. We have a history, not just from 1959. We have a very long history of great writers, musicians, composers, uh, medical doctors before BC, before Castro. This is not new. So we are very proud of our culture, not of our dictatorship, but of our culture. And uh, I, I, I use something uh, very simple that I can say: if I am, if I were not Cuban, I would like to be one. And from early childhood, you you lived there for your first 20, 30 years? My father was a saxophone player. He was a, a classical saxophone player. So I grew up surrounded by, by music all over the place. I, he, he, he also uh, used to have a small, very tiny uh, musical import office. So I grew up surrounded by people like Chico Farrell, Cachao, uh, Pedrito Knight, uh, Celia Cruz, uh, husband even before they married, uh, Chocolate Armentero, Ernesto Lecuona, all those great musicians that I, I didn't have any clue who they were. So they only became legends of, of our music. Yeah, that's great. Um, you, we were asking people the other day too, I mean, I heard this sculptor from England the other night on the radio and he said each project he does whether you realize it or not, it holds a seed for the next project. Have you? I mean, you've done. I mean, you have an incredible body of work you've done. Do you, do you feel like you you sort of grow each one from the previous project? Maybe. You know, sometimes they. they my, my grandmother used to say that some people out of the game see more than people playing the game. So may, maybe that's true. Maybe that's true because every project that I do is like a segue. Whoever say that, I think he was right. Yeah. It's maybe it was my secret intention, not secret, but hidden intention. But uh, I love doing different, totally different uh, uh, type of project. But each one of them is related to the one before. Yeah, you can say that. Interesting. Well, and I've heard you just won a Guggenheim this year, right? I won a Guggenheim this year, Guggenheim Fellowship. And how are you going to use it? <laughs> I, I, I got two old dreams. Well, I have many dreams, but one, one of them was writing a concerto for contrabass that already I uh, premiered in Caramore, the Caramore Music Festival. And the other dream was to write an opera, a Cuban opera. Of course, it's a comic opera. And it's called Cecilio Valdez, King of Havana. And uh, he had a, a social uh, implications and also uh, racial implication, all, all that in one, one story. I have been held by a, by a great uh, writer from, from Cuba, a, a, a drama writer called Enrique del Risco. We put together this, uh, this story about a, a, uh, a beautiful lady from the high society in Cuba, you know, she's the, the, uh, the daughter of a general, who fall in love with a black singer, which is uh, the, the guy's a kind mm -hmm. of prospect, you know, he, he, uh, he sings in a, in a secret place and he's not allowed in TV. Uh, but he's the king of Havana because all the women are crazy about him. Mm -hmm. and Interesting. So this opera, I, I put all my heart in this opera and, and I have a whole year to develop. That's really, uh, that's exciting, yeah. And, and, the, and the interesting thing about it is that I am going to use uh, lyrical voices 
uh, Cuban voices and jazz voices and pop, all, all that in one, in one single, uh, in one single piece. You know, I think nowadays, you know, that the Soviet Union is not so hostile to the United States. People forget about the era that you came through in terms of, you know, you, you had to defect and so forth. I mean, could you talk a little bit about the sort of political turmoil that shaped your early life there? The communists came to Cuba in 1958, I mean in, in 1959. Before that, we had problems, like, like all countries in Latin America and, and the entire world. So it looked like the, uh, the changes in 1959, everybody was so happy about it. We thought that was going to be a real paradise for us there, but it became a, a, an Stalinist state, state, the same thing as the Soviet Union. Uh, Castro was always talking about the Soviet Union as a goal, as an example. And I said to myself, well, may maybe, maybe they are right. Maybe, maybe if, I, if one day we go to the Soviet Union, we can see what is going to be the, the brilliant future of our country. Oh my God, when I went there in 1968, I said, if this is what my country is going to be snowless, then it's time to leave. Because it was, it was terrible, you know, it was really terrible. And you, you tell a story in your book about one of your friends just, he spoke to you one night and then the next day he was gone, I can't remember his name, a fellow musician who defected. Wow, yeah, yeah, oh, a very dear friend of us. Yes, uh, well, we're going to talk about the, the, my sax life. It's a, a yeah, yeah, and yeah. This book called My Sax Life. Yeah, that is written in a very uh, j uh, jazz way, jazzy way. And I talk about my friend Julio Vento, who was a, a flutist in the uh, musical theater of Havana. I was the only person that knew that he was leaving the, the following day. And he, he left in a... Ra in a <laughs> In one of those uh, uh, rafts made out of, the, of a wheel of, of, the, of a truck and a piece of wood or something like that. <laughs> he had a great sense of humor. Julio Vento, and then he asked him, what are you doing here in the middle of the sea? What are you doing here? I, I am fishing for, hunting for sharks. Said, hunting for sharks? Do you have a, a knife or something? No, 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 no. I grab them by the neck. <laughs> and then the policeman said, Sharks have no necks. <laughs> <laughs> you explain that to the captain in the unit. <laughs> so it was very sad. But he spent like ten years in prison. But but didn't that didn't that wasn't that sort of the impetus for you to start thinking about leaving yourself? Well, yeah, but in some way, yes. Vento was an inspiration. In some way, but well, there is so many so many stories about uh, people trying to leave. When we went to Azerbaijan in 1968, for example. People escaped to Iran, to, you know, to escape to Iran. Yeah. yeah you know, and, and they have all that, all that, the camp was, was uh, full of mines. It was very, very uh, dangerous. How do you move between the classical world and the jazz world so easily? As I said before, my father was a classical saxophone player. He never had the ability to improvise. But he loved Les Young, the Ellington Band, and especially the Benny Goodman Orchestra. So I grew up listening to every type of music and I didn't know the difference. Still today I don't make too many difference between one world and, and another. It was just music. In, in order to, to, uh, to play different sports, you have to change your techniques, but still are sports. The same thing with music. You have to do minor or major adjustments. But I enjoy as much playing uh, Brahms as I enjoy playing uh, Ellington, the Ellington music. But I have to confess that I, when I have to improvise, I enjoy a little more. But I love the music of, of Brahms or Beethoven as much as I enjoy playing the music of Dizzy or, or Monk. And some people described you as a, as a child prodigy. I mean, do you think of yourself as a child prodigy? Because a lot of those people kind of flame out. You know, they don't mature from there, but... That's the problem. I. I I received a, a great musician called Gonzalo Roy wrote a dedicatory to, to me when, I, uh, when he signed my, my student book. I said, I am terrorized of, of, uh, of child prodigy because sometimes those child, they, they don't mature. It's like those kids that have beautiful voices when they are, for, when they are kids and then when they grow up, the, the, the voice is not there anymore. But well, thanks God, in my case, I am 
just a well-trained musician. I have to thank this to, to not only to my father, but but to all the people that have been an influence on me. I got two questions right there, and uh, the first one is. I mean, most people don't know your biographies. Tell them, tell them how you started playing at six and that sort of thing. T t what was your first gig? And My first instrument was the curved soprano. I, I, have, I still have it, a curved soprano. Uh, Tito, my father, you know, I'm sorry, I keep talking about him all the time, but he, he's responsible. I want to blame him for all of this. He was a genius in, ped in pedagogy. Let's wait, let's wait for just one second. I'll just have you start over again. From the beginning? Yeah. As a child, I mean... Uh, my father gave to me, he imported from France, from the Selmer Company, a, a tiny curved soprano when I was five years old. I, and he trained me to play the instrument in seven or eight months. And then present me when I was six years old. And that happened in 1954. It happened to be the... the very uh, first year of the Newport Jazz Festival. So it, it cost me like 53 years to <laughs> practice and practice and practice to get to the Newport Jazz Festival. How do you like that? That's a great story. <laughs> it's a great story, huh? <laughs> and, and the other question, uh, now I'll see if I can remember the other question. Yeah. Um, and can I ask him, yesterday we talked to Marcus Miller and you asked about the, the, what public you learned on the street and what you learned. Right, 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 right. So yeah, you, you are a classically trained musician, but some people were talking about the difference between learning in the street. What do you learn in a, in a bar, playing in a bar versus learning in school? You don't learn everything. A, a lawyer don't learn how, how to fight in court in, the, in, in Harvard. In Harvard, they give you the tools that you are going to use in court. Of course, if you don't have those tools, you do nothing in court, you know. So my life, my training have been a combination of all that. Uh, when they told me, if, when they asked me if I am a, a, a classical trained, I say, I am a trained musician. I have my training in the uh, in the school, at home with my father was the best school, and also in the bar, and in the opera, uh, play, playing opera and playing ballet and, and playing in the symphony and playing in the in the concert band and the big band. I, I play so many, so many things, you know. Even during my days in the school, I think it's important to, to train. At the same time that you do your, your conservatory training, you have to go at night and play around with people. Because it, it's nothing you can, uh, there is things that you don't learn in the school. Can you, can you paint a picture for people about what it was like in, in Havana to go in as a young teenager and play in a bar? I mean, I don't know what time, when your parents let you do that, but. <laughs> well, I had to be, I had to be at home early, you know. But mo most of those people that I hang out with, uh, in those days, was friend of my father. So I, I used to go around and, and, and just play, ask for permission to play. Sometimes uh, I play in the, in the Hilton Orchestra just to accompany the show in the big band. I asked the, the lead out of there, can I, let me play, you know, go, you go to the bar and let me play the show here. That's because I was, you know, friend of my family and all that. So it was a good training because you, you, you learn a lot how to play with the singer and, and with the dancers, how to how to blend in the uh, in the orchestra and the the saxophone section, it's a beautiful learning process. You, you know, as a, as a trained musician, uh, in your book you give people hard time who can't read music. I, I think I remember once asking Dizzy as a joke because I knew the, the answer. I said Dizzy, tell me the truth. You you knew Charlie Parker very well. It's true that he played by ear that he didn't read music. And this would get really serious to that. You know, he, he smiled, he said, he said, nobody can play that way by ear. He knows what he was doing. So I think it's, it's very important. I, I know that there is many great musicians that play by ear, but you cannot set that as, as, a, as an example to young people. That is against the, the, uh, the uh, I don't know, the, the uh, ethics. It's like, like telling uh, young people, Charlie Parker played totally on, on drugs and he played beautiful. You don't say that to young people. You, 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 you say that, you, you, can, you can tell them that Charlie Parker was a great musician that unfortunately was on drugs. Or well, the same thing, he was a great musician who don't read. He, would have, he wouldn't be a, a lot better musician if he can read music. 
I would be a better musician if I were a piano, for example. I regret all my life not being a piano. Wow. Uh, that doesn't mean that I am better because I don't play the piano. You cannot be considered better to know less. That doesn't make any sense. You are better if you know more. You are, if you speak five languages, you are better than me that speak this terrible English that you are listening to now. You yeah. know? The other thing you the other thing you talk about, and I, I'm not sure what the era that this you're describing from the book. I, I've lost track of the date, but you come into New York and you say a lot of the people here think they're playing Cuban music or Latin music. They're not really playing Latin music the way it should be played, or you know the true part. You you talk about fraudulent mambo kings in your book. I mean, I don't know who you were referring to. <laughs> what? Fragile? Fraudulent mambo kings. Ah, flat, you say, you say that it's in your book. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know, I mean, has the, has the Latin music scene changed in terms yes. of becoming more authentic? Yes. or For many, many years, not only American, in Europe also, they, they, they treat the music of Latin America with very little respect, like a toy, you know? It's something that is very funny, but you don't, you don't uh, study it. This he told me once, Latin American musicians understand our music better than we understand theirs. And I say, Dizzy, as much as I respect you a lot, that is not accurate. We are not more intelligent than, than you bring us are. We are not supposed to be more intelligent than you are. Only that we pay more attention. We, we, we learn the music of Monk, your music, the music of, of Ellington, all that. We pay a great respect to that music. On the other side, most most of the, of the, uh, the musicians from the other side, they don't pay any respect to us. For them to, to play Brazilian music is, is what they call the, the Carmen Miranda syndrome. The if you go to, to, uh, to uh, Brazil, you don't, you don't see nobody talking like that. Nobody do that in Brazil. So where did they find that out? So uh, all, all you need is more respect for the music. But I think that is improving now. More and more people are are, are le trying to learn more and more about, about our music. Yeah, and another... Okay. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to keep you much longer. You say some Americans have not been able to assimilate the, a basic concept that the percussion cannot get in the way of improvisation and, and vice versa. Okay. Can you explain that for people? In many occasions, mistakenly, when they want to emphasize the, the, uh, the Latin factor, they bring many percussionists. That can be fatal if they, don't, if they don't relate to each other and if they don't know what to do. It's like in order to play symphonic music, you bring more violins. If you bring more violin, but they don't know what, how to play with those violins, it's going to be even worse. So it's the same, it's the same concept. Uh, the person who wrote the most uh, Afro-Cuban music in the piano was a white guy by the name of Ernesto Lecuona. And he had that Afro-Cuban uh, flavor in his music. And he didn't use not even one single bongo, not even a cowbell. Because the thing is not in the percussion, it's in the, it's in the percussive way to play the music. Can you, can you go a little bit for that? I mean, what, what do you mean percussive? Percussive is the, a rhythmic way to play, like, like, like the way uh, 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 Teddy Wilson plays the piano, it's very percussive. Obeo Valdez is, is very percussive. Even in, even Monk plays the piano in a very percussive way. I gotcha, I gotcha. Um, Without using drums. <laughs> I have nothing against drummers. How did you get the, the nickname El Pac-Man? Pac-Man is the only electronic uh, game that I can play. I love it. I have a couple of them. I, I have one in each floor in my house. I love, I love the Pac-Man. And uh, that nickname was given to me by the the the, the, uh, the, fa the, the, uh, the founder of the Miami Film Festival, my friend Nat uh, Nat Sheriak, who was the person who gave the name to my book, my sad life also. So naturally, I called me the, the, the Pac-Man. Hey, the Pac-Man is here. And he gave the name to my sax life also. He's good for me, for me, me. There, uh, Somebody else said you have a di diabolical sense of humor. <laughs> no, I used to. I used to. When I was a kid, when I was a teenager, I was a heavy practical joker. 
Yeah. I, I, I didn't dare to do that before. But it was good. It was good at that. <laughs> it, um, I'm going to ask you one more. Um, we talked a little bit about with the other musicians about how, how is it difficult for you to move from a private space of being a private person into the public performance area? I mean, how do you handle that move back and forth? I am very seldom at home. I travel a lot. So once a, a friend of mine say, you, 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 uh, on the stage, you look like you are, at, you, you are like, like at home. I say, because I am never home. My home is the stage. So I feel very comfortable treating with people and playing with other people. I love the stage. The same way I love people and great artists. So have you been out on the stage here? I mean, have you seen the view out there? It's pretty amazing. It's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you must be pretty psyched to play to here today. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's fun and it's, it's great to be here playing tribute to, to one of my favorite people, which is uh, uh, Dizzy Gillespie. And in, in my concert, I'm going to dedicate it to a dear friend who died two days ago, uh, Mario Rivera. Tell, tell me about your connection to Dizzy then, just real quickly then. I mean, what is it you really admire about him? Well, I, I admire Dizzy for many things, for his open mind. He loved the music of, uh, of the illegal alien so much. And uh, he was always ready. He created a great space not only for him, but to others. He was so open to let other people shine around him. He was, in other words, he was very generous. And if you want to know the, the way I met, I met him, it's also in my book, but this is funny. I arrived home one day and uh, I found a a note written in a in a, in a paperback from the, the uh, grocery store in the corner. It, said, it was written in Cubanli, I, I mean in Spanglish. It said, Paquito, we have been looking for you. Donde estabas, DC Gillespie? Then I went to the corner, and before I talked to the guy there, the, the, the bodeguero, he said, there was a black guy here dressed like Sherlock Holmes looking for you. <laughs> then he said, uh oh, that is Dizzy Gillespie. <laughs> That's interesting. He got one of those uh, earphones, uh, uh, tape with a double brim hat and a, and a pipe. And he was black and, and so he said, oh, wow, Dizzy Gillespie is in Havana. Then I wrote, uh, I, I wrote a, a short story called Sherlock Holmes in Havana. Very cool. Um, we're asking people, I don't, I, I know you're, we're asking people to thank JVC for, oh. you know, they've been supporting jazz festivals all over the world. For, yeah, I, I don't know, I mean, I don't know how to ask you that question. How do you feel about JVC? Okay. Go ahead. Ready. Uh, you want to do it to camera or to me, Bill? It'd be better if you could just tell it to okay. me. Okay. It's better. Too. It's better. JVC has been sponsoring this festival since 1984, and they do festivals around the world. This is what the festival folks are trying to do is put together a thank you for the supporting live music and for continuing to support there you go. You can do it right to me. Oh, before I finish, I, I think I, I should thank George Wynn, first of all, and then JVC for supporting this music that made us so happy for so many years. So we need people like the JVC people and people like George Wynn. So thank you for inviting me here and please call again. <laughs>